your word, we may see your face, hear your word, and know your touch on our life. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do sit down unless you want to stand for the next hour and a half while I <laughs> talk at you. Um, I realise this might bring back bad memories for some people and good for others, but does anyone remember when Margaret Thatcher entered number 10 Downing Street? And, um, oh dear, look on your, <laughs> look on your faces. Um, do you remember what she quoted before she entered number 10? Prayer of St. Francis, which says what? Make me a channel of your peace. Oh, we don't need to go any further, did we? Um, but the interesting thing was that, although a very controversial figure, when Margaret Thatcher did that, she knew what she was doing, and she also knew that everything that came thereafter would be measured against those first words. And that, in fact, is how the Gospels work. The Gospels are a particular form of literature. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels. They're a particular type. John is different. But they work on the same basis. Um, a bit like Roman biography, that the first thing that the subject of the Gospel says is what he is going to be measured by. And in the rest of the gospel, everything you read, everything he says, every encounter he has with people have to be reflected against that. Is he fulfilling what he set out right at the beginning? That's how the gospels work. And in Luke's gospel, the first public thing Jesus does, apart from his baptism, is when he gets up in chapter 4 as we have it. But you have to remember that the gospels didn't have uh, chapters and verses. They didn't, in the Greek, they didn't even have a gap between the words. So translation is a very interesting exercise when you're dealing with that. It's just one string of writing like that. So the first thing that he does is he goes to, back to where he grew up. He's gone through all the um, baptism and all of that. He goes back to where he grew up. Now, I think this is a brave thing to do. Uh, one of the great things in my life is that I left home, and um, I could just stop there, couldn't I? <laughs> I? I left home, grew up, and I came to university in Bradford, grew up in Liverpool, came to university in Bradford, uh, worked in Germany and France during that time as well. Then uh, Linda and I got married, we moved to Cheltenham, uh, where I worked at a place that's big in the news at the moment, so but I'm not going to say anything more or I'll have to shoot you. Um, <laughs> And then uh, after that, we went to Bristol for three years to theological college. And then four years in Kendall as, uh, as a curate. And then nine years in Leicestershire as a vicar. Then three years in South London as uh, an archdeacon. And eight years as Bishop of Croydon. Now two years in Bradford. I think the moral of the story is always leave before they catch you out. <laughs> so we've moved around a lot. But if you had to go back to where I came from. Do you know, there would be a little bit of fear because they know what I was like. And when Jesus goes back to where he came from, having wandered around a bit, there's always the fear that if you get up and say anything vaguely religious, vaguely pious, someone's going to get up and say, yeah, and do you remember when? You can be seen through. But he goes back to his home territory. And he goes to worship on the, uh, the Sabbath day. And as the rabbi would do, he reads the lectionary reading. The scroll would be brought to him. He opens it up and he reads. And these are the words that are going to haunt him and against which he is going to be measured. From Isaiah 61, which we had read earlier, and then referred to again in the Gospel reading, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has appointed me to preach good news to the poor, and so on, to give sight to the blind. 
Now, when you read the rest of the gospel, you've got to be looking at the people that Jesus met and say, in what way is this a fulfillment of these things? Now, one of the intriguing questions in the gospels is not what did Jesus say that was good news, but what would be heard as good news? I mean, if I asked you tonight, um, what would be really good news for you to hear? I wonder what it would be. You won the lottery? You better start playing it then, I suppose. <laughs> um, for me, Liverpool to win the Premiership, Manchester, <laughs> Manchester United to get relegated, along with Everton and Spurs, or Manchester City. That's just, you know, laying out my, my cards on the table there. Not that I think it's very important. <laughs> or it might be um, that the good news for you would be that something really good happened to your family or someone who was in trouble was rescued. But if you're wandering around Nazareth, around the hillsides of Galilee 2,000 years ago, what would have been good news? What would have sounded like good news? Well, these are a people who are longing to be free. They're longing for the Roman occupying forces to leave them, to take away the blasphemy of having to walk around with coins in your pocket that bear the inscription of the head of, or the engraving of the head of the emperor with written around it, emperor and son of God. Every daily transaction they make, even if they go to buy bread, it's a blasphemy. And these are a people who take these things seriously. They are being polluted by the unholy. And God will only come among them again when the unholy is removed, has, been, has departed. That's what would have been good news for these people. So when Jesus reads from Isaiah 61 and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach good news to poor people, what people would hear is, well, we are the poor people. We are the people who are oppressed. We are the people who are not free even to worship in our own way. We are the people who are bound by other people's view of us. And as Jesus goes on, he's going to give sight to the blind, to set prisoners free. Do you know, I've met prisoners. I've been in a lot of prisons, always as a visitor, I hasten to add. <laughs> But in South London, I used to visit Brixton, Wandsworth, and Belmarsh. And every Christmas day, the bishops in the Diocese of Southwark spent Christmas morning in the prisons. And I've met prisoners who don't want to be set free. Because if they're set free, they have to take responsibility and live in a big world where it's scary. And actually, within the prison, there is a routine, and, they, and someone else locks the doors, so you have no responsibility. So there are people who don't want to be set free. But I wonder if there were people wandering around the hillsides of Galilee who heard Jesus read from Isaiah 61, words that were etched into their memory, the corporate memory of this people, the Jewish people, people who were longing for freedom. And I wonder if they thought, well, it's okay about the people being set free. What about me being set free? from my captivity. Do you know, I think all of us, to some extent, whoever we are, find that we get trapped. We get trapped by our reputation. Do you know, um, several years ago, when I was Bishop of Croydon, I took a group of 20 to our link diocese of central Zimbabwe. And while we were there, I saw the best newspaper billboard I'd seen for a long time. It said, prophet drowns during baptism. Not much of a prophet, I thought. But anyway, this, th th this was big, big news over there. I also found in the middle of the bush, um, I'd got a photo of it, a bus, a single-decker bus, and uh, painted out on the side, it said Croydon Borough Council. I thought, 
you travel a long way to get away from Croydon and what do you find in the middle of Africa but a bus that they bought from Croydon. Anyway, we got into big trouble. We had problems. It was 2007. Inflation was running at 10,000%, uh, which was minimal compared to what it ended up as. We had trouble with the secret police. We had trouble with the media. And I walked into it a little bit. And on the front pages of the national newspaper, the day after I'd done a press conference with uh, the governor of the Midlands province, who was a member of the Mugabe cabinet, and I was very careful with the television cameras. They could never get a photograph or a film of me smiling, nodding, or looking pleased. So I had to be very disciplined. And I spent the whole time looking down during this press conference, looking very stern. And uh, if I moved my head at all, it was like this. So they couldn't get any film. And afterwards, the journalist said to me, um, why... Why did the British media give such a bad picture of Zimbabwe? And I said to him, well, you don't allow the British media in. They have to get it all second or third hand from Johannesburg. You, you're ban you've banned the BBC and the national newspapers from coming into the country. So why don't you let them in? What are you frightened of? A democracy does not have to be fearful. Let them in. And then if they print rubbish, or lies, you can refute it. And then I made the mistake. I said, back in the UK, we know we get stitched up from time to time, you get misquoted or misrepresented, but you can come back and argue your case. And that was translated into the front page of the national newspapers the next day, we managed to keep it off the telly, that I denied there were any problems in Zimbabwe. It's all UK media lies. And I spent 400 quid on my mobile, phoning the Foreign Office, Lambeth Palace, the Diocese of Southwark, to make sure the story got back before it really hit the news. But if you Google me, even now, if you scroll down a bit, you will find that I am a Mugabe supporter. <laughs> yeah, serious. There was a four-page interview with me in a glossy magazine called New African about two months later that purported to be an interview with me. They'd never even had any contact with me. But it was picked up from this story, and it was me, the Bishop of Croydon, saying that there were no problems in Zimbabwe. And I still get the occasional email from someone accusing me of all sorts of stuff because of that. How? Now, that's trivial. But what happens if you have a reputation from which you cannot escape? Not because you don't want to, not because you haven't moved on from it, but other people won't let you. I was talking to Jonathan Aitken some time ago. Every time he appears in the press, he's disgraced former cabinet minister, Jonathan Aitken. Not reformed, not converted, not restored, not doing a huge pile of good for people, but disgraced former cabinet minister Jonathan Aitken. In a society that doesn't allow us to be free, what would be good news? You see, there are other people. We, we can think of, as you go through the Gospels, people who are blind, people who have their sight restored. But at the same time, there's a game going on because there are other people who are having their eyes opened to the truth about God and about themselves. People who have been told for generations that they didn't count, that God wasn't on their side because God works like this. That God couldn't be on their side because they are ritually unclean by being female or by having particular illnesses or by touching a corpse, or by mixing in the wrong, wrong uh, company, or by not doing the right things. And therefore they are unclean and to be pushed to one side. And Jesus comes along and says, dare you believe that God loves you? Dare you believe that God is on your side, even though the church, as they might have called it, tells you a different story? 
And what you see as you read through the Gospels is the same as our stories, where when our eyes are opened, we realize that in the grace and generosity of God, we are loved infinitely, and nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ, as Paul put it. That's what the story is about. We could spend a couple of hours this evening just going through the Gospels, from memory if necessary, picking out the stories of people who discovered that after a lifetime of being crippled by all sorts of stuff, they found they were able to walk. That people who had been blind to the mercy and the love of God discovered in the face and the touch of Jesus Christ that they had a life. That people who had been deaf to words of goodness and joy, of love and mercy, found that they were listening to a different melody, one that would haunt them for the rest of their lives. And whatever the rest of the world told them about their value, they would not be able to shake off this haunting melody of hope. I'm reading a German book at the moment that I caught a line, it, I put it on my blog as well if you want to follow it up, the haunting melody of hope or haunting music of hope or something, in which the writer says, hope is the gift amid the, to be able to hear amid the cacophonies of the present the music of the future. That's what resurrection is about. It's the future coming forward into the present, and now we live in the present in the light of that. It's that melody like a bad jingle that you can't get out of your head. I mentioned in something I wrote a couple of days ago um, that um, song uh, from Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat, Any Dream Will Do. What rubbish that is, Any Dream Will Do. No, it won't. It's Hitler's do, or Stalin's, or the anti-Semites. don't think so. Any dream will not do. But anyway, I just mentioned this, and uh, someone went on Twitter and said, thanks very much. Can't get it out of my head now, can I? <laughs> That's how hope works. It's the haunting melody that people in the Gospels heard and saw and felt when they came into touch with Jesus that their life was restored. They were given a new place in the community. They were given a new future. They were given an identity that nobody could take away from them because it was rooted not in the opinions of people, but in the knowledge that whatever else, we are infinitely loved by the God who has made us in His image and said, you will not be taken from my hand. But it doesn't stop there. And this is where confirmation comes in. We are to be the agents of that in the world in which we live. We are called as the body of Christ, think what that means, to be the agents of that hopefulness, of singing, of whispering that melody that will haunt the imagination of our friends and our family and people whom we come into contact with that there is another world, there is another hope, there is another way of being, there is good news for those who are oppressed, there is good news for those who have been told that they do not count, there is good news for those who are trapped in their reputation or their past and cannot be free. That's the gospel. And we are called to embody it, to speak it, to live it, to proclaim it, to put up with it and stick with it even when the evidence tells a different story. It doesn't exempt us from the world and all that the world can throw at us. They crucified Jesus. And you know, after he preached his sermon following that reading, do you know what they did? They took him out and tried to push him off a cliff. That's a bad thing to do to a preacher because he's doing his best. When you are confirmed this evening, the first thing I'm going to do is sign you on your forehead with the sign of the cross. That was done to you in baptism. And it's indelible. 
the sign of the cross. I'm going to look you in the eye. I want you to look me in the eye, not bow your head and look at me feet. Because I want you to hear really clearly what I'm going to say. God has called you by name and made you his own. And only when you've heard that will I put my hands on your head and pray that you will be filled with God's Spirit. And as I do so, you may hear the echo of those words, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to give sight to the blind, to set free the captives, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour even if they try to push you over the cliff at the end of it. May God bless you as you enter into this relationship with him and the rest of us. Amen.